Hello and welcome to IHBC at COP26, Conserving Buildings and Places Conserves Our Planet. Today we welcome Nigel Griffiths. Nigel was the director of the STBA, the Sustainable Traditional Buildings Alliance, from 2013 to 2021. Prior to this, he was a consultant in energy efficiency policy development for UK government, overseas governments, and many other agencies. He's the author of several books and lectures widely on sustainable buildings. He is the sustainability advisor to the Build It Self Build Group, develop retrofit plans for traditional buildings and portfolios, and audits renew renewable heat installations on behalf of Ofgem. He continues to work on some STBA projects and provides policy advice. Well, welcome, Nigel. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you for inviting me. Well, I'd just like to start uh, by asking you to tell us a bit about yourself, how you got started, and why you're passionate about sustainability and conservation. I suppose the, the probably the most important thing that I would uh, stress about my own background is that I was a builder. So um, the conclusions that I've reached that I come to basically have a, a, a practical um, understanding at their, at their root. Um, I lived for a while in California and therefore became familiar with timber frame buildings, a different approach to building and um, I think at that stage, beauty also became very important to me because they really do make some lovely buildings out there out of timber. Um, I, I also spent much of my working life as a builder, and where I'm from, in fact, is a, a suburb of, of Birmingham called Harborn, which is a very beautifully preserved Victorian uh, village. And um, I mean, older, I think, possibly than Birmingham itself. So um, that gave me a real love of those buildings as I repaired them and uh, had a great um, admiration for the people who built them. That's great. Uh, now, I want to talk a bit about policy because I know you've done a lot of policy work on behalf of the STBA, sort of putting the various levels of both climate change policy as well as heritage policy in context. Can you give us a bit of a synopsis of sort of the various levels of those policies and, and how they impact upon the built environment? Uh, I'll do my best. Um, but one of the best places to start is is to quote the late Neil May, who who founded the STBA, or co-founded it, and um, he said that na sustainability started off as a nature project. And I think what's happened in the last few years is that the uh, the climate change agenda has has dominated to a um, very great degree, um, and therefore. Um, that, that's rather narrowed the the sustainability agenda, and that's really where I think we've we've um, developed some problems because nationally we followed suit with that, and we we do have policies to protect heritage as well, and there are international policies about uh, culture and heritage, and I think probably one of the most important of those um, is the uh, the UN's adoption of culture as a, a fourth pillar of sustainability. We're all familiar with environmental, economic uh, and social um, foundations of sustainability, but culture is now recognized as a very important uh, part of it. And therefore, uh, heritage being part of culture um, must really come into, into sustainability. So um, the way we've taken things forward nationally, um, we, we don't really integrate that. We've got policies about uh, retrofit and they're, they're really driven by, uh, by energy and by the climate change agenda. And until recently, at any rate, they haven't uh, properly integrated um, the other pillars of sustainability. And looking at some of those policy implementations specifically, can we talk about some of the things that had the biggest impact on, on the built environment, things like building regulations and, and EPCs, sure. and, and, and what, what are we trying to do? What's the intention there, and, and have they worked, or are there some shortcomings? Well, I think in, in, the, in the sense that they've worked through to the, uh, the legislation and, and the kind of um, practical Im implementation in the UK, it's really all been about the climate change agenda. And a lot of it was driven from the EU's Energy Performance of Buildings Directive, the EPBD. Uh, and that, I think, is where a lot of the, the, the fundamental problems lie. Now, it's almost a kind of um, a license to print money for industry because it, it kind of maximizes change. It's focused on an individual building approach, a building by building approach. It, it completely misses the subject of embodied energy. I, in other words, its metric is emissions from buildings in use. Um, 
I mean, not only that, it misses all the other environmental concerns which are important about uh, buildings. And um, therefore, it, it, it's, it's a terribly narrow agenda. And it's narrow agendas that, that produce, um, well, they produce zealotry, among other things, and they certainly produce unintended consequences. And the way that was implemented in the UK, um, the PBD, was essentially via the building regulations. So um, you basically get ever tightening energy performance uh, requirements for new buildings, which have been implemented through the, uh, the regulations, um, which I don't have a problem with. Um, but they also introduced uh, more stringent standards for making changes to existing buildings. And this is where it gets complicated because existing buildings differ um, very, very widely. And even apparently homogenous buildings um, can be different in terms of uh, their, their condition and the kind of alterations that have been made to them. Uh, and especially the way that they're occupied, lived in, basically, um, whether they're domestic or non-domestic buildings. So I think that's a, a really big issue for for the implementation is that it's it's basically come down in a in a sort of silo fashion. Um, you mentioned EPCs. There's all kinds of issues with, with EPCs. Um, in the UK, in particular, the headline rate which we have on on EPCs is actually based on not carbon emissions, but it's based on the cost of fuel. So you have a, a system where the legislation is trying to minimize carbon emissions, but the metric you're using is based on the cost of fuel, and that produces some really bizarre results. So for example, you take a building which is currently heated by uh, some form of biomass, uh, or let's say a heat pump. And if you then switch that to uh, diesel oil, um, you'll save money and you'll improve your EPC score, but you'll make your carbon emissions and other forms of pollution, etc., and the use of diminishing resources, you'll make that problem worse. So we've got a, a fundamental mismatch between, on the one hand, the desire, and on the other hand, the kind of implementation metric. So um, there are other you know, issues with EPCs in terms of specifically how they, they uh, look at traditional buildings, i.e. You know, the solid wall masonry in particular. And there are you know, a lot of people who live in older buildings don't feel the need to have a kind of constant com comfort air temperature of 21 degrees uh, everywhere. The old fashioned way was uh, if you were cold, you moved nearer the fire. And if you were too hot, you moved away a bit. Um, uh, Robin Pender of Historic England always says we, we've forgotten how to sail these buildings. We've forgotten how to use them effectively. I think she's got a very good point. Yeah, absolutely. And, and you, you mentioned sort of all the, the differences, building typologies and construction and history and everything else. It's so important, right, to, to understand your own building when you go to try to make a change. Now, I know you were uh, instrumental in developing the guidance wheel at the STBA, which, which is really interesting talk. Can you tell us a little bit about that and how uh, a building owner might go about sort of checking the different interventions they might do and how it might affect some of the other bits of the building they may not be thinking about? Mm, sure. Uh, the, the guidance wheel um, is something that we, we built um, six or seven years ago. Now, it's an online tool. It's free to access. Um, and what it really is is a risk identification and management tool. So it, if you basically select a, a particular measure, a particular measure, um, from within a whole suite of retrofit measures within the wheel. Um, having first uh, um, entered the, the context of your building, whether it's uh, particularly exposed to the elements, whether it's um, a high status heritage building or, or, or low status, um, the type of user that, that the building has. So all these are what we think of as context. Having put all that information in and selected a measure, it will then identify first of all three basic kinds of risks so firstly the, the risk to, to achieving the savings that you're actually looking for um, and there are all kinds of ways in which retrofit measures can go wrong and, and do go wrong um, uh, secondly it identifies technical risks so um, those are usually uh, to do with moisture and, and moisture build up in building fabric they're also to do with uh, air quality, indoor air quality, and uh, the impact that that can have on health. Uh, and thirdly, the wheel also flags up different sorts of heritage risks. So certain measures will um, have a, a negative impact on heritage, but it's perfectly possible to carry out very high quality retrofit while uh, preserving and enhancing heritage. Uh, you may be taking out, let's say, a, 
um, thin double glazed um, UPVC unit and going back with something more akin to the, the original pattern of the windows, but which is also much more airtight than the original um, and which, which is much more energy efficient than the original. So you, you can uh, both improve heritage, minimize technical risks and, and ensure that you do achieve the, the savings that you want to achieve um, through through the use of this wheel. So it provides those, um, in addition to showing those risks, it also demonstrates the interactions between measures. So if you uh, were to consider insulating a wall, then you also have to consider um, the junctions between the wall and the windows, um, the junctions between the wall and the floor and the roof. And at any of these points, you might get uh, a condensation risk if you've made the, warm, the wall warmer, uh, you have uh, made other parts of the building fabric uh, cooler and therefore uh, relatively cooler and therefore more prone to condensation in particular. Um, and if you want to create a, a complete thermal envelope, then you have to consider these adjacent bits of building fabric. So uh, those interactions uh, are, are terribly important and um, those have actually been, been kind of taken up in, in future standards. Right. Well, it's, it's really an excellent tool and it, it brings to mind I know I've heard you talk about the whole building approach as well uh, can, can you talk about that a little bit and how you how you've actually seen that start to be manifested in policy sure um, when we we started off uh, in 2013 ish we wrote a report for what was then the Department of Energy and Climate Change called uh, the responsible retrofit report and that uh, that phrase responsible retrofit we, we hung on to for some time and we actually produced a publication called planning responsible retrofit which guides you through all the measures you have to take from from thorough survey etc uh, through to con sort of considering all the different interactions um, between parts of the building and and, um, and between uh, fabric and services so um, that particular publication is only 24 pages long and it's again it's a free download from our website I'd, I'd recommend to uh, to everybody as a, as a kind of starting point and then during the the, the period of a couple of years after um, those initial reports the phrase whole house started to emerge and eventually we, we began to think well this needs a definition because um, it's been used in many different ways and some people used whole house in the sense of um, every bit of the house, fabric only. So, you know, insulating the walls, improving the windows, insulating the floors and the roof. Well, that's not enough because whenever you change the um, thermal performance of, of a wall, uh, you change its moisture performance, but you also reduce natural um, air leakage or natural ventilation. So um, I think the phrase no insulation without ventilation is, is a very good one and um, therefore intermediate kind of whole house retrofit considers ventilation, it considers heritage, um, it considers all the, the um, interactions between uh, building fabric and building services. It's no good um, doing all the insulation work and not addressing the heating controls because um, you know, you'll end up with an overheated house or a, um, a building which is heated in a patchy way. You, you've got to have that integration of the services as well, and that includes ventilation services. So that's the kind of intermediate um, stage of, of whole house retrofit. And we published a, a paper back in 2015 called What is Whole House Retrofit? Also free download, very short, four pages. And that then takes you to a, a it suggests a, a further stage, what we've called advanced whole house retrofit. And what that does is to bring into um, in, in, to bear the, the community aspect of retrofit and it starts to look at much more widely about the, the sorts of things that we can achieve when we start to look at making wholesale changes to our built environments and I know that you'll want to come back to that a bit later on um, in this interview so I won't go into that more deeply now uh, except to just mention that it, it is um, flagged up in that 2015 paper. Okay. Okay. Great. Yeah, I, I that, did want to come back to that. Um, but first, uh, something you touched on a little earlier. You know, it's no no secret that there's been some failed policy initiatives around uh, this issue here in recent years. Do Do you see? I mean, what what's your take on on why that's happening? Are there sort of themes or missed opportunities that uh, 
that need to be addressed? I mean, I mean, how do we create this, you know, successful policy in this area? Okay. Um, well, I'll, I'll tell you what, I'll start with the success and then go back to the, to, to the, the failure. I mean, the okay. success so far, and we've very much contributed to this as STBA, I think has been the publication of a new standard uh, for um, domestic retrofit known as PAS, that's publicly available standard, PAS 2035. And that has got multiple aims, and that is the, the, the most wonderful thing about it. And it starts off with the health of the occupants, it recognises those. And it then um, talks about energy efficiency, of course, but it also talks about the importance of uh, protecting and enhancing heritage. And for a public standard in the UK on retrofit, this is new ground, so we're very, very uh, pleased with that, that came out in 2019, um, and that covers domestic buildings. But PAS 2038 will cover non-domestic buildings. And I suppose the other thing that's come out of, of, of some of our work on, on uh, whole house retrofit is the formation of the UK Centre for Moisture and Buildings. So they are looking very much at the kind of technical risks to do with um, with retrofit, and um, they've, they've sort of taken on that aspect of STV as well. Um, but I think that was a great question about the, the, the failed policy initiatives and we could start with the Green Deal back in about 2012. That had a very narrow focus and was frankly, frankly dangerous um, because there was no you know, consideration of, of people's health. Um, you've also had schemes like CERT and, and, and CESP and um, they, they led to also schemes like um, what happened in Preston where rushed and botched um, narrow focus retrofit work actually um, ended up with buildings being uninhabited and I'm uh, sorry uninhabitable uh, as mold growth um, appeared on walls walls became wet um, a lot of uh, real technical errors and I suppose that's in part what drove the uh, the determination of all those involved to um, to get past 2035 done and past 2038 as well um, so it's those kinds of failures and at the worst end of the scale you've got buildings like Grenfell and Grenfell was perfectly safe when it was built but you know if you add the, the equivalent of I think it's somebody calculated 5,000 litres of diesel on the outside of a building um, if you basically coat it with that much flammable material and build in a, a convenient chimney for the fire to take hold um, you know, you're asking for disaster and I'm afraid that's what we got and there's, there's a lot more narrow focus policy still out there I mean if you look at the clean growth strategy um, and the uh, private rented sector public uh, regulations, which uh, which came out at a similar time, they're all based on EPCs, and it's just entirely the wrong metric. What we ultimately need is a whole house metric that looks at the impact of, of retrofit on people's health and well-being. Um, and you know, the, the, there've also been during the pandemic there was a revert, reversion to this kind of earlier model of just let's spend some money quickly on insulation. And I think it shows you how how much the insulation industry has going to boss the government around in, in, in this way, um, not just at national level, but I think the um, the EPBD was another case in point. So what we need is, is a plural agenda and. All those schemes, the the, uh, the CERT, the CESP, the Green Deal, the um, and the regulations and, and the, the policies to do with PRS and clean, clean growth, they all miss opportunities. And, and health is, is the biggest one. Community regeneration, local employment, water efficiency, uh, sustainable drainage, all those, those things are basically um, missed out of those previous retrofit schemes. And, and this is what I think we need to begin to change. Right. So it seems like the past documents are, are getting their step in the right direction. But again, still with, right. still with an individual building. Right. And, and you just started talking about it there. I, w I wanted to go on a little bit and talk about, you know, the, the benefits that can be had from increasing uh, our scale a little bit and not just looking at the granular buildings. I know you're doing a lot of work now looking at areas to um, places, to neighborhoods, that sort of scale. And what can be done there? Can you, can you talk a little bit about what are some of the opportunities at that scale? I think we've got to start with communities. We've we've had a a long period in um, UK and, and possibly international policy where um, the importance of communities has been downgraded. We've we've lost a lot of community facilities from post offices to pubs um, to to small shops. 
um, there's been a, a great deal of centralization going on and uh, local government and, and parish governments very much been downgraded. One of the things that's happened during the pandemic is that we, we started, I think, to turn a corner and started to value our communities, our immediate environments more, especially the natural environment and uh, people's mental health, uh, as well as their physical health, is starting to come into a much sharper focus. And uh, the fact that just walking around a, you know, a healthy area that's close to you is, is um, really, really important and uh, to have places to, to meet, to congregate. So I think we've got to start with with communities and, and their health. And you know, if you want to look at it more in terms of um, the, the energy issues, then I think um, community-based energy schemes are probably going to give you a lot more bang for your buck than putting individual renewables on buildings. You do get economies of scale with everything. So uh, I don't see why energy shouldn't be, should be an exception. Um, the same thing applies for sustainable drainage and, and um, People say, well, sustainability, and you're talking about drainage. Well, yeah, it's part of it. I, mean, I, I live in Somerset, and um, it floods for a pastime here. So sustainable drainage is important. And um, we, we also need genuine localism. We, we need to um, empower communities with the, uh, the ability to make decisions about what's important to them, uh, what's important to them um, in what they value. And if they say, well, we, we really value these streets, these old buildings, um, the appearance of these streets and old buildings gives us a sense of place. Well, then we need to retain that and enhance it and, and repair it. Um, I think that is is really important. Um, but I think the same applies to communities which aren't necessarily heritage communities. And I, I did some was privileged to do some work um, on behalf of Welsh government and the EU a, a few years back, looking at the Arbed schemes in uh, in Wales, Arbed two specifically. And people were saying to me, yes, we're very grateful for, for the insulation and, and uh, for feeling warmer and for the lower fuel bills. But do you know what? It's, it's given the whole community a, a, an uplift. It's made feel, people feel better about where they live. And people are now starting to clean up their front gardens because the houses look so much better. So what those sort of uh, schemes have done, they've got people talking to each other. They've actually reestablished a bit of a sense of community. Um, but they've also begun to address the not just fuel poverty, but the poverty of expectation. And it's that that which really blights so many communities um, in, in Britain. And um, It's helped to, to begin to address that. Well, that's really fantastic. Thank you, um, Nigel. I think we'll wrap up there. I just wanted to end by asking you, what does the future look like or what should it look like in terms of sustainability and conservation of the built environment? Well, I think the most important thing is that there is no conflict between sustainability and, and conservation, because conservation is, a, is an integral part of sustainability. Uh, so ultimately, sustainability is about the kind of future that we, we want to leave to our children and grandchildren. And that surely includes heritage. It also includes a clean and, and, and green natural environment and, and beauty. Beauty is so important. It's the truth that dare not speak its name about buildings. Uh, and heritage ultimately is a shared asset, so uh, you know, it's not just the people who, who live in, in uh, heritage buildings that are important, but the whole community that, that uh, lives in and around them. So um, I don't see any conflict between heritage and sustainability, and I really hope that that is the, um, the, the way forward for, for the two.